Welcome to Grumpy Vegan Grandad, Dan here. Today we're going to talk about banning. Is it a good idea? Should we be advocating to ban meat products, animal products, all animal products, animal agriculture? Should we ban it? Is that what we're striving for? Now, I know some of you may disagree and some of you may sit on the fence and some of you may disagree totally. But we've got to look at banning and what does banning do? When we take away the people's choices, what we can do is look back into history. Let's look back a couple of hundred, 300, 400 years to the slave trade. Black slaves taken from Africa, taken to the Caribbean where they worked on plantations. That was banned. That was banned eventually. Now was it a good thing? Oh, yeah, it was for the victims, definitely. But what did banning mean? I want to ask you a question now and see if you can answer it without googling. So back in the early 1800s, 1830s I think, when slavery was banned, the government compensated the slave owners. They compensated the slave owners. So my question to you guys is, right, when did we stop paying that compensation when was the last payment made when did we complete the payments what year I'll give you a few minutes so in the meantime these slaves were liberated slavery was banned it was stopped but has slavery disappeared well slavery has never disappeared slavery has always been a thing and slavery in all its forms whether it's sex traffickers, child labour, slavery still exists, it's never gone away. And there could be an argument, well, back in the day it was regulated. They had to meet certain conditions. It's all sounding very familiar this, isn't it? And I know all the anti-vegans and the carnists now are going to be saying, oh, he's comparing veganism to slavery now he's comparing black people to animals no i'm not don't even go down there i'm talking about banning and what the bans did what the liberation of the slaves did and how that compares to the act of banning things in a in a social context how does it work what does it do so anyway you want the answer don't you so I'm going to read this because it's a bit, it's a bit, uh, I don't understand it all, so I'm sure some of you out there, some of you political guys might be able to work this out. But based on a government census in 1834, over 40,000 awards to slave owners were issued. Some of the payments, now this is the bit I don't understand. Some of the payments were converted into 3.5% of government annuities. But they lasted until 2015. The last payments were made in 2015. Now this converted into 3.5% of the government annuities. I, I don't understand it. But basically, we paid the descendants of the slain owners the last bits of what we owed them for taking away their business in 2015. Wow. So let's move on. Let's move on a little bit forward, a little bit further into the future. Prohibition. 1920s America. Prohibition. What did prohibition do? So in America, there were there was strict religious people out there. There was there was groups who were against alcohol and yeah. They decided to do a temporary ban that lasted quite a while. Originally, it was it was during the First World War because of they didn't want to use grain 
um, the grain for booze rather than feed the people. Um, so yeah, but then it turned into an amendment, the eight, I think it was the 18th amendment, that all alcohol was banned, moving of it, brewing of it, tr transition of it, moving it over the country, movement of selling of it, all got banned. All got banned. Was that a good thing? Was that a good thing? No, because it went underground. It went underground. We had the speakeasies. Al Capone earned $60 million a year off the illicit booze trade, off bootlegging. The speakeasies, the brewing of, of alcohol wasn't regulated. It was all underground. It was dangerous. They put all sort of, sorts of mad chemicals in it. It's still happening today. Illicit vodka, where they put all sorts in it, antifreeze. But that's not through a ban, that's through high taxes, which leads me on to the next. Fast forward a little bit more, and we had the high taxes. During the 80s and 90s, the tax on cigarettes, because obviously it came out that, that tobacco was causing cancer and lots of health problems. The government decided to put high taxes on it. They also increased the tax all the way through the 80s, all the way up through to the 90s. Just in the UK. But when you went abroad, on your holidays, wherever, you left the country, you left the UK, you could buy duty free. There was no duty on it. So cigarettes were like a quarter of the price. Alcohol, wine was, was a fraction of the price because of all the duty and tax that the UK government put on these things. So what did we do? We started going on what was called a booze cruise. Literally jumping onto a ferry at Dover, going over to France where there were massive supermarkets, still are, go into the supermarkets, get thousands of cigarettes, thousands of bottles of beer, bring it back into the UK. And people were doing that. In fact, the Sun newspaper give tokens out where a, a car could go across to France on a ferry for one pound. You had to collect the tokens and you could go over. I actually did it myself with my friends. We saved up the tokens, got the pound voucher. We, we sailed over to France, bought an absolute shitload of alcohol and booze and brought it back over for a fraction of the price. So even taxing, taxing things, putting high tax on them to put people off, it doesn't do anything. So where am I going with this? Where am I going with this? I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Is what I said in the beginning. Is banning something a good thing? Is stopping people's choice a good thing? Even if, it, if it's for their own benefit, even if it's for their own health. Does it work? Is it a good thing? In some cases, yes, it's good. It's good for the victims, the black slaves. If we banned, if we banned animal agriculture in the UK and the whole UK was forced to go vegan, would that work? Nah. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's no use banning anything because the minute you ban something, it goes underground. I'll give you another example. The Irish mink farmers. This year, 2022, is when the fur ban comes in, in Southern Ireland. So you're no longer allowed to farm any animals for fur, mink especially. The three mink farmers in Southern Ireland are now multi-millionaires. Or they will be when they get the compensation. They will be. There's, there's eight million euros to be split between them. And they'll probably ask for more because in the UK, when we banned it in 2000, we banned fur farming in the UK in 2000, we gave them nearly six million a piece. And did this stop it? Watch this video. It's only a minute, watch this video.
Sensing that the end for fur farming in Britain was near, Michael Kobeldick bought another farm in Denmark, where he breeds 45,000 mink a year. Now the ban is in place, he is considering rearing and killing his mink there and sending the pelts back to Britain to be prepared for sale. All it does is actually stop me raising mink here on site. It doesn't stop me processing mink, it doesn't stop me um, selling mink from this site. The British fur farmers are negotiating compensation from the government for the loss of their industry. Michael Cobbledick is demanding £6 million. Obviously, if the government have pay us and that, we're going to be using that money to expand our Danish operation. I mean, you know, I mean, I shall make sure that happens. So, in effect, the British government will be paying you and you will be expanding mink production somewhere. Yeah, I mean, the government's taking me into Europe, basically, and expanding my operation. So, not only is this arsehole in the UK become a multimillionaire. Not only has he become a multimillionaire, it's not even stopped him from continuing his barbaric, disgusting, horrible, torturous, evil industry. He's moved his, he's got all this money, he's moved his operations abroad. He's doing exactly the same, only out of sight of the UK. The UK with the most welfare legislation in the world, the best welfare legislation in the world, has now forced him to a different country where things might not be the same. We shouldn't be advocating to ban meat or ban dairy or ban egg. The egg industry, we shouldn't be advocating for that. It does not work. In most cases, it pushes everything underground. It pushes things out of sight. If we banned meat in the UK, what do you think would happen? All these little remote farms, they wouldn't have nobody watching them, they wouldn't have nobody... Oh yeah, it'd be illegal, but that's never stopped anybody. Who's ever stopped anything because it's illegal? You know, murder exists. Nobody's, people haven't just stopped murdering because it's illegal and you can get life in prison. It doesn't stop them. It doesn't stop people. All it does is make it make it worse for the victims because now these these cows and sheep and pigs and chickens they'll be kept in hidden places underground in caves in hidden places out of sight out of view no legislation governing how they should be treated murdered on site any way they want that's what would happen if we banned meat that's what would ban if we banned any sort of action the answer is not to legislate for bans. It's not even good to legislate for higher prices. Because the, the minute we legislate for higher prices, taxes on meat, taxes on dairy, if, if eggs went through the roof and it was, it was an absolute fortune for eggs, people would go on the booze cruise, wouldn't they? They'd be shipped from abroad, they'd be flown over, they'd be, you can't stop it. They can't, the government can't stop cocaine coming into the country. Heroin. It costs billions just to police our borders for illicit drugs, let alone a couple of dozen eggs. It's not going to work. What we need to be doing is grassroots activism. What we need to be doing is getting rid of the demand. We need to be getting rid of the demand. That's the only way. When it, when it, if the slave owners, if the slave owners, if everybody stopped buying sugar and cotton or whatever else they made, molasses, whatever they produced, if people boycotted that, we wouldn't have been paying them compensation. They would have shut down through lack of business. We wouldn't have been paying compensation to those people. The, the mink farmers, if we, if we got everybody to, to boycott it and realise how bad it is, we wouldn't be paying millions of compensation and making these evil bastards multi-millionaires. We wouldn't. We've got to stop the demand. And the only way we can stop the demand is to educate people on the industry. That's the only way. We've got to talk to people face to face. 
We've got to talk to people and show them the truth. So all you out there need to get active. Everybody watching this, you need to get active. You need to be talking to people. Doesn't matter who, where or when. How can you tell if someone's vegan? Because within five minutes, they'll be standing up for the animals. They'll be standing up against torture, against rape, against murder, against depression of animals. That's how you know when someone's vegan. Be proud to be vegan. Be proud. Be proud to be standing up. Who cares if people go, mm. oh, I hate that Danny. He just goes on about veganism all the time. I don't give a fuck. I'm gonna keep going and you should all keep going. Get talking to people, join your AV groups, join your Facebook groups, join your We The Free groups, go to vigils, go to any sort of social action. Talk to people, talk to people in the gym, talk to people in the supermarkets. Be proud of who you are. Be proud because we're not gonna change anything unless we get the people to change with us. We've got to bring them with us. Banning won't do nothing. So please people, get out there, get active. Save the animals, save the planet, save yourself. Go vegan. Give me some of that.